What a beautiful little dog, was, however, this imperturbable young lady's greeting, as if it were the most natural thing in the world to encounter the son of Matt Decker between Wirren Hill and Beckery Mill on a quiet Sunday. Oh, what a darling little spaniel. Ah, Sam felt so abysmally happy at that moment that in his confused rapture he raised the small gloved fingers she held out to him to his lips and made way for her to sit down by his side. The little black dog, who had already shown signs of intense nervousness at the approach of this composed figure in her costume of fastidious delicacy, and had been even uttered three short barks, became panic-stricken at this. He tugged frantically at the blow tie, lowering his belly almost to the ground and extending his four feathery paws in a wide, straddled flurry of panic. Finding that the blue tie did not yield, and hearing from the tone of the human invader that she was not at present ill-using his new master or belaboring him with sticks and stones, the dog rose to a natural standing position and remained there stationary. But, although his body was motionless, his short tail pressed down in quivering terror over the round black rump, uttered these the words as clear as language could utter them, Nothing, I say, nothing, could persuade me to look around at the terrifying transactions that are now taking place behind me. That's the dog speaking. I'm so glad I've met you, Angela Beer observed, rubbing nonchalantly at a tidy red stain that had appeared on her white glove and glancing coyly around at the stiff back of the little dog. For I wanted to ask you whether Mrs. Zoyland would like me to call upon her at the vicarage. Do you think she would? I keep hearing. Here her pale lips displayed her white teeth in a proud smile. Such silly gossip, gossip about you all. But father always says, believe nothing that you hear and only half of what you see. Sam turned his face full upon her. If I, he said, believed only half of what I've just seen... I'd be the happiest person ever born in Gladstonbury. The girl's arched eyebrows lifted a little upon her smooth white forehead. Did what you saw hurt your wrist, she said, and then, in a really charming excess of compunction that brought a rose petal flush to her white cheeks, let me tie it up for you, Mr. Decker. She produced a little laced-edged handkerchief, and as she bandaged his hurt, the softening influence of medical tenderness that had been number one, that had made one, number one weep to think of the innocuousness, the innocuousness, of sparrow dung, brought tears to Sam's eyes. Will he let me pat him? Do you think? She said, and leaning across Sam's knees, she gave a jerk at the straining blue tie. This movement had the result of causing the dog to sink down instantly on his belly, straddle his legs wide apart to gain the necessary purchase, and then tug at his leash with the energy of a frightened alligator. All right, don't eat mine, cried Sam to his new pet. But the girl drew back with flushed cheeks, evidently a little hurt. Don't you mind, he repeated, turning from the dog, who now stood erect, although still shiveled with terror to his disappointed companion. He's a rather nervous little beast. I guess I should be saying that. Don't you mind? All right. Don't you mind? But. Rather nervous, laughed Angela Beer. He's like I'd feel if I came to see your Nell and she didn't want to see me. This your Nell ought to have given the stupid Sam an inkling of how he was regarded by the richer gossips of the town. He very clearly was anything but Howley Sam in the upper circles of Glastonbury. But he answered guilelessly, Now would be overjoyed to see you, I know. You'd rather go home, Mr. Decker, she said, and get that penny of yours to tend to your wrist. But when he took down not the slightest notice of this, What, she inquired, did you say just now that you saw? The man was far too happy to be squeamish about telling her everything. He would have liked to have stopped every soul in the streets of the town and told them everything. He was in the mood to shout everything to everyone from the top of the tour. But how can he go on saying, Mr. Decker, protested Angela after an interval of silence, 
when he had talked about, to, about it to her for nearly a quarter of an hour, as you did just now, that there is no God and no life after death and no personal Christ. You couldn't have seen the Grail if there wasn't a God, certainly not if there wasn't a Christ. Come now, Mr. Decker, you know you couldn't. I'm afraid it's a man's pride in you that makes you talk like this. Listen, Angela Beer, until a few months ago, though I didn't believe in God or in immortality, I believed in Christ. I believed in him as the tortured enemy of God, as the friend of all the oppressed in the world, and I still believe in him, but not in the same way. Do you understand? No, I mean... No, I suppose you don't. Not in the same way, but far more than before. He stopped and stared at her and there was a wild light in his little greenish-colored animal eyes that made the calm young lady say to herself, I must talk to Dr. Fell about him. I believe he's had some terrible mental shock. Mm, I agree. Do you think, Angela Beer, he went on, while the muscles of his chin worked frantically, and without knowing what he did, he tugged so hard at the blue tie that he made the dog rear up like a rearing horse. Do you think that a person could give up the sweetest happiness in his life? Not just one great thing, but THE thing, the only thing, if you weren't drawn in by some capital R reality. I guess that's a white spot? I don't know. It looks like there's something on my mustache, but I think it's just a tint. It's a tint. It's nothing. Ah, where was I? You poor darling, thought Angela to herself. Don't you know that people have been driven on by the unreal, capital U, by lies and illusions and fables and pure madness, to the point of killing the only thing they've ever loved? I can see you think I've gone dotty, my dear, he added with an indulgent smile, laying his bare hand on her gloved ones as they lay clasped in her lap. And I've no doubt that you and your friends think I've been a devil incarnate to leave Nell. Well, never mind that. What I'd like to know, if you wouldn't mind telling me, for I know what a friend you are at Percy's and that. His broke, voice broke when he marked the floor of color that rushed to Angela's pale cheeks. Never had Sam beheld such a scarlet blush. It literally fluttered her under her black hat. It flowed down her white neck. Her very eyes, ears seemed to yield themselves to it. Up went both her gloved hands to her face, and she the face that she had to make this gesture increased her shyness. She looked at Sam as if she might be going to rise from the bench and run away. So who's Percy again? I having a mental block. I'm I'm sorry, but I'm gonna. Have to, is that Persephone? I think it's Persephone. He's talking about their lesbian affair. Okay, I'm just gonna go on. I didn't mean," stammered Sam. The girl struggled with herself and dropped her hands, staring at him with round blue eyes, while her underlip quivered. Slowly her color receded, and her face became paler even than its wont. You seem to know all about us, about our friendship, Mr. Decker, or you wouldn't ask me. So, so I may as well tell you. All Glassmary will know in a day or two. Yes, I've heard from her. So she is talking about Persephone. I haven't seen her, but I've heard from her. She's gone to Russia. Sam was flabbergasted. I'm a little flabbergasted. She's in Russia. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bored today, so I'm going off on tangents. She knew, he knew so little of the great world outside Glastonbury that there sounded to him a shock of straddling finality in this. It was a second before he realized the import of this news in his own life. Zoyland was alone again, then. He looked at this girl by his side. Angela was searching in the same little handbag from which had come the handkerchief that now bound his wrist. She brought out a letter in an envelope now, and snapping the clasp of her bag with an impatient jerk, threw the letter upon Sam's knee. "'You can read what she says if you like,' she cried." There was a French stamp upon the envelope, and Sam com commented upon this. Read it! Read it! She murmured. Read it! Read it! She murmured. Read it! Read it! She murmured. 
The letter was certainly not difficult to read. Written in Persephone's bold, boy-like hand, it was brief and to the point. Darling Angel, it ran, Long before you get this, I shall be in Paris, waiting to catch the express to Warsaw, en route for Russia. I couldn't stand it a day longer. I couldn't stand anything in our damned country. I must have a complete change or kill myself. I've gone back to politics, my dear, now that I have found love a fizzle. I believe Russia will suit me to tea. When I am settled, I may send you and for you to join me. If you like me still, that's to say. Tell Mr. Beer that the meals on Trent French trains are adorable. Don't be cross now, for it had to be. Your hopeless prissy. She handed the letter back to her... Sam handed the letter back to her while the words, He's alone at White Lake again, formed themselves in his mind. I'm sorry you've lost your friend, Miss Beer, he said gravely. But as she says, perhaps one day you'll go to... to Russia. He uttered these last words as if they referred to some region so remote, as indeed they did, from his present world, that it was as if he'd said, To the Isles of the Blessed. <laughs> the girl lowered her fair head in its black hat over her handbag and replaced the letter with slow deliberation. She seemed to be pondering deeply, for she remained motionless for a minute, her fingers on the envelope within the little silk-lined receptacle. Then she rose, slowly, to her feet, and shook the front of her skirt and passed her fingers quickly over the back of it. Well, she said, holding out her hand for a, with a smile, I've got to prepare my school lessons now, so I won't ask you which way you're going. But if I were you, Mr. Decker, I'd go and see your penny at once about your wrist. Two hours later, in fact, just as St. John's clock was chiming half past four, Sam left his loft chamber with the black dog comfortably asleep under his camp bed and sailed forth into the street. His face was washed and clean. His step was light. Angela's handkerchief was still round his wrist just as she had tied it. He came out that afternoon impatient to tell all the world what he had seen. I've got to go to Nell and Father tonight, he thought, but not till after the evening service. He was so dazed with his new happiness that he gave no heed at all to the direction in which he was walking. He moved along like a somnambulist. Now and again he talked to himself in low mutterings. For normal persons to talk to themselves is either a sign of great happiness or of great unhappiness or a sign that they know themselves to be surrounded by absolute physical loneliness. It's true. Look at me right now. <laughs> Is it a tench? He kept muttering quite audibly. What he was always reverting to in his thoughts was the necessity he was under to tell everybody in Glastonbury that he had seen the grail. And several times he stopped various errand boys and tradesmen's wives, whom he knew by sight, and began to tell them, or began to gather himself up to tell them, but by some queer psychological law that seemed inevitably to slip away from him before he had forced them to listen to him. He came to a degree to have that queer sensation that we have sometimes in dreams, that everything we touch eludes us and slides away. He even got the feeling that the pavements were soft under his feet and that the people he passed were like ghosts who moved without moving their legs. At last he found himself walking in the immediate rear of ex-mayor Wallop, whose cor corporal reality did seem to strike him as more emphatic, and Sam, hurrying to overtake him, entered into conversation as they walked side by side. It seemed much easier to tell Mr. Wallop about his vision than these other cases. This was no doubt due to the fact that it was something seen, and not something felt, or thought, or imagined, or supposed, that Sam had to relate. Well, I'm sorry it was a little silly this time around, but that's what you get. That's free, right? Till next time, I'll see you in Glastonbury. Cheers.